today at the museum on the track a father takes his son back to school on a classic Brooklyn's bike Three magnificent men try and get their flying machine there, born. Good luck. But takeoff proves tricky. We're not getting enough power from the engine to really get it airborne. And it's wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat at Goodwood. Starts to rain more, then this circuit will become very, very slippery. Where vintage cars compete for the Brooklyn's trophy. As long as they come back, all in one piece, I think that's the success. That's 110. There's not a huge amount of weight on them, is there? So it should be OK. Brooklyn's has always been a place for blue sky thinking. I don't know whether to take this patch one off well, first. Well, I just was wondering whether it's worth taking that. Take this one off first. Um, yeah, it's one of those classic five-minute jobs that takes five hours. It's home to some of the nation's oldest and flimsiest aircraft, piloted by pioneers who risked life and limb to get them airborne. And to this day, the museum still attracts aeronautical adventurers, like Julian Aubert. If you hold it there. OK. He has a track record of building startling and, to be honest, slightly scary planes. And his latest project is to get a Brooklyn's curiosity up, up and away. That I way? think the tail should be the other, the other way. You want it the other way? Yeah. So that we're ready to take off. Yeah. <laughs> Having spent hours restoring this glider, called Ladybird, today he's assembling it. OK. But it won't be easy. There are no technical drawings to refer to, and nobody knows if this motor glider, classified as a microlight, has ever flown. It's an aeroplane that I have never seen assemble, and to be quite honest with you, I don't even know where they will assemble. So it's a bit of a day of discovery, and, uh, and uh, in some ways a great day if it all works out as planned. But he's not on his own. Julian's roped in his friend and experienced pilot, Rob Frank, to help him. Down? Yeah. But Rob doesn't yet share Julian's love of Ladybird. The wings are the best looking bit, to be honest. Better than the fuselage looking, I think. <laughs> Rob, I think you're not going to be my friend anymore. <laughs> For God's sake. No, I'm only winding you up. <laughs> The plane was created by Bill Manuel, who served in the RAF and worked on the Vickers Vimy at Brooklands. But his lifelong passion was gliders, and the last one he built and assembled at the museum in the 1980s was Ladybird. There are no records of it ever flying, and only grainy pictures to know what it once looked like. First job is to jigsaw Ladybird together like one giant model plane. They start with the tail. Yes, it goes through. That's that's quite encouraging, really. Which is secured by bolts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We are closer to getting it ready to rock and roll. Yeah, it's all right, actually, isn't it? It looks better now, because it's got things that make it fly on it now. <laughs> <laughs> Once this primitive glider is pieced together, Julian plans to get it airborne. Yeah, rather you than me, Julian. Have you got the other one there? Was yes. It? I want to do my job now. Yeah. You're going to, I want to be unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> Make redundant. But before she can be flown, there's the small matter of some wiring to attend to. You're missing a wire there. Rob, you are doing half a job. Well, this one here? No, what about, what about this one? Ah, well, I didn't know that. That's the... Um... That goes here. To the rudder as well. Yeah, got you. I didn't realise it. This is to support to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it. This is support. Oh, got you. This is yeah. the landing okay. wire. Oh, just the landing wires, eh? Doesn't sound important at all. It's incredible how simple everything is, really. I've got the same wheel as this on my sofa at home. Look. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> everything was done with a minimalist view uh, in, the, in terms of weight and strength. Ah. 
Yeah, it wants to go down more, doesn't it? I think. <laughs> Getting the wires in and tensioned properly is tricky, but crucial, as many of them connect to the joystick, and that controls most mechanisms on the glider. Ah. Right. Done. Thank you. It's looking more and more like a plane, isn't it? Yeah, really. Yeah, it is a glider, Julian. Hey, motor glider. Uh, absolutely, yes. Excuse Head me. Up. Respect. Great. You see, oops. Yeah, he's lost one. <laughs> the last job of the day is making sure the wings, which haven't been fitted to the plane this century, will reattach. Just watch that seat belt there. That. Oh. The fit has to be perfect. See, it needs to be the leading edge. Let me see. There. There's something wrong here. The, 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 uh, now it should oh, oh, oh. But with just the right ratio of skill... That's it. That's it. ...and brute force... It's in. Yeah, I've got it in, yeah. The wings are attached. Well, that's so Ooh. good. Julian can't fly Ladybird today as the engine, which helps her to take off, needs overhauling. But he can enjoy this incredible moment. He wants to sit on it now. Of course though. I am. What was a bunch of wires and wood this wow. morning is now a unique motorized glider. Look at the that. Tail's not coming up. Look at that. Look at the wings. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, that's good. OK, now, health and safety. Yeah. You have to strap yourself. I think you do want to wear a crash helmet flying this, really. I've got a just in, case, just in case it goes over. Look at that. I think it's amazing. Amazing it may be, but powerful it ain't. Ladybird's engine, which could be up to 60 years old, is playing up. So Julian heads back to Brooklands, where he meets engine specialist and volunteer Ian Dabney, who'll help work out what's wrong. Yeah, and this engine is a, it's a little Chrysler. It's the one that was fitted on the Ladybird, you know, the motor glider that oh, we, okay. we, we hope to get um, airborne. It's all made out of aluminium. What the engine is, effectively, is the same as a, a chainsaw engine. And like most chainsaws, you pull it to get it going. See that? Or not. Now, maybe you can see something. I can't. The engine isn't sparking into life. No. So it's, it's not all the time there. We don't okay. have a spark all the time, so that may be part of the problem. Or what? Why not? And an intermittent spark won't get this glider off the ground. Ian reckons the spark plugs need some attention, a job Julian can tackle later in his workshop. Ian, what do you think about the engine? Do you think it's a good engine or do you think it's not really going to be good enough for what we're trying to do? Well, I think it's a very good engine. Um, you know, two strokes are very powerful because, in fact, you've got two... Double. Yeah. Double the power strokes. I don't know if I put my life on it, Julian. The problem I find with a two-stroke is that they will run beautifully. Everything will be great, and suddenly, boom, stop. Exactly. There's That's no I mean. warning no. whatsoever. If it was me, I, I think I would... Gliders normally have to go up with parachutes. Glider pilots have parachutes. So I think that would be a very good idea. A very good idea. Yes. A glider that may never have flown and an engine that may never get started. Julian had better hope that Ian's suggestion isn't one he'll ever need. I always struggle with these bolts. In 1907, Brooklands hosted one of the world's first motor racing meetings at a purpose-built circuit. Another Whitson holiday attraction was at Brooklands. Speed fans lined the stands and the paddock. It was modelled on a day at the races and proved popular in the decades that followed. Spectators crowded around the track, racing cars were shod with tyres in paddocks and drivers were known as mounts. Brooklyn's no longer stages these events, but the legacy lives on. And every year, pre-World War II race cars gather at the Goodwood Revival in a bid to win the Brooklyn's trophy. 
This year, gunning for glory at Goodwood in a car that raced at Brooklands in the 30s, but turned his head in the swinging 60s, is keen racer and motor fanatic Nick Pellet. I'd been about 20, 25 years old, and I saw Go 52, one of the 105 Torbots. I've photographed the car with my old little black and white camera. Very, very long time ago now. Crazy about motors, Nick saw the Go cars at another race meeting decades later in 2002 and resolved to buy one. You can't just order a, a car like that out. So it was, I think, six or seven years later that one finally came up for sale and uh, very fortunately I was able to acquire it. Nick bought Go 54, one of a quartet of Go cars with sequential number plates made by a company called Talbot in 1931. Once he got it home, he made an amazing discovery. To my surprise, in the glove compartment of the passenger uh, door, I discovered this plaque, and it is John Cobb's plaque from the 1932 500-mile race at Brooklands. I mean, he's the man, John Cobb. John Cobb held the land speed record three times and made a name for himself at Brooklands driving its most famous car, the Napier Railton, which he commissioned. John Cobb in number 30, who gave us thrills. Watch how the huge car flashed by the little fellow, fighting against his handicap, lapping at 130 miles an hour. But before the Railton came another. Here they are at Brooklands, 1932. Here he is, John Cobb in Go 54. The Talbot team will be out in force at Goodwood, and because these motors are regularly raced, they need lots of TLC. So Nick's off to check up on them. They're being worked on in a Cambridgeshire garage by Nick's teammate, race rival and master mechanic, Gareth Burnett. Hi Nick, good morning. Good to see you. We're going to be ready? Uh, yeah. For Goodwood? Sure. Totally co trophy. Confident, uh, <laughs> confident in this car, very yeah. confident. Um, yeah. There's not too much to do no. for her. So Nick's ride is in fine fettle, but Gareth is racing Go 52 at Goodwood. It's got a big hole in the front where the engine usually is. Yep, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's having a fully rebuilt new engine fitted to it. Each driver competes individually for the Brooklyn's trophy. But because the cars so seldom race together, Goodwood is a rare opportunity to shine as a team at this invitation-only event. And Gareth is the number one Talbot driver. How many times have you won Le Mans uh, Classic? Three wins at Le Mans Classic. In this car? In this car, yeah. yes. yes. So it's pretty it's significant to get you up and running for the for, for Brooklyn the Trophy. There's uh, not much pressure on then, yeah. is there? <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> Rebuilding Go 52's engine is a huge job. So basically, we've got the new block, mm -hmm. the crankshafts fitted to it, camshafts fitted to it. These are the other connecting rods, pistons, yeah. the new cylinder head. So between Noy and Goodwood, our job is to complete this engine, finish it. Ready to ready to go. Okay, so you've got a lot of work to do then, Gareth. Gareth gets cracking. First up, he's working on the pistons. They pull air and fuel into an engine cylinder on a downward stroke. When they move up during a compression stroke, the fuel and air mixture is compressed in a small space known as the combustion chamber. The difference between the volume of air and fuel sucked in on the downward stroke and its squashed volatile volume, ready to be ignited by the spark plug, is expressed as a compression ratio. The greater you compress it, the bigger the bang, the more power. Gareth wants just the right amount of compression to put him in pole position at Goodwood. Going too far is risky. We want it high. But we don't want to go too high, or else we'll be into detonation and blow-ups. Having adjusted the piston to suit his race strategy, Gareth needs to know the exact volume of the space left inside the cylinder when the piston is at its highest. Filled my uh, pipette with, you know, with fluid up to the calibrated level. 
He cleverly calculates this volume by seeing how much liquid he can squeeze into that space. Okay, that is now filled. So I can read off here, I can measure how much fluid is getting into there, and I can see it's 34 cc's. So I can work out the compression ratio. One step further forward, a lot more to go. In the workshop at Brooklands, Julian discovered that the spark plugs for his latest project, a motor glider called Ladybird, weren't sparking. But back at his home workshop, he's confident he can adjust them and get this two-stroke revving. We can take the flywheel out of the, of the engine and see what happens, um, see if we can get a spark. The spark will ignite fuel in the combustion chamber, and that's critical if his glider is to take off using power from her engine. I need to play some magic trick. To see them, he needs to get the flywheel out of the way. I want to give it a whack here, and hopefully that will unlock it. No. Yes. Right, so, that's the flywheel. Ian's diagnosis was right. The spark plugs need attention. So he sets to work, cleaning them and adjusting the gap that the spark has to jump across. And now we seem to have the right gap. Hopefully that was the problem. And um, let's put it together and see whether or not we get spark. And a spark needs fuel. So next, Julian turns his attention to the carburetor, which mixes fuel and air together before it's combusted. We need to apply a little bit of hell and safety, um, which means doing a little bit of dangerous things. The engine needs fuel in the carburetor to start. Unsurprisingly, Ladybird doesn't have a modern fuel injection system, so Julian gets hands on. I'm going to feed the fuel line with fuel. Uh, don't try this at home, folks. This is a fuel line Go into the carburetor so you can see. So very carefully, we're going to inject some fuel into this. The engine is now primed, all ready for combustion. Drinking quite a lot. Ah, there you are. Let's put this away. <clears throat> and now, I think we're ready to give it a go. Died. Well, probably, obviously, the carburetor needs a bit more fuel. Right, that's really exciting, right? Almost there, almost there. Wow, that was something. Whoa, that's to me is success. I'm not sure your neighbours will feel the same way, Julian. To get an engine that is 60 years old to run is just wonderful. I think it's running well enough for me to put it on the plane. So I'll take it to the Ladybird this afternoon. I'm going to join it to the Ladybird, which is where it belongs. And I'm going to fit the propeller that I made onto the engine and see what happens. See, here we go. Julian thinks the Ladybird is a self-launcher and is relying on her engine to get airborne. In a couple of hours, he'll find out whether his quick fix has worked wonders or not. Brooklyn's ERA shed is home to some of Britain's most amazing racing bikes. They're kept in fine fettle by volunteers and custodians. And some exhibits are lent to the museum by owners like Charles and Roger Bird. They own a 1928 Model 18 Norton, which won the Grand Prix at Brooklands in 1927. But after a life-changing injury, Roger made a big decision. After my accident in 2017, I decided that it was time to pass my 
three Nortons onto my three children. Um, so Charles inherited this one. <laughs> Actually, it was the most expensive of my three Nortons. Um, it was 37,500. The bike's unique backstory makes it hugely valuable, but it's about so much more than money for Charles. Yeah, it's amazing my dad's passing the bike over to me, you know, truly honored to be the owner of this amazing machine, you know, and, and the history which comes with it, especially around Brooklyn. Charles has never ridden the bike, and the pair have set a date for his inaugural ride. It'd be one of those moments in life which you look back and say, I did that. Want to get want, my... Do you want your toolbox? Yes, please. OK. But for now, they need to check whether the Norton, which hasn't had a run out for two years, will start. First job on the list is to lubricate Charles' heirloom motor. I'm just going to uh, grease the, the rockers, I hope. The rockers are metal arms involved in opening and closing valves in the engine's combustion chamber. I really could do with a drip tray, I think. Can we get a drip tray from the display? No, well, a little pot. I just want to drain these, see if there's any oil in the sump. OK. On this bike, the sump is a reservoir at the bottom of the engine, designed to collect, supposedly, a small amount of excess oil. There you go. That's quite a lot you'd take off there. Eh? Yes, that's what I'm saying. It would have smoked, wouldn't it? That's why they smoke. Yeah. Because <laughs> basically, you should just have a, a, a bit in the bottom that just l turns over and lubricates it. Point that out to the mechanic next time, Dad, yeah? You'll learn. <laughs> when it's been sitting for some time, the oil drains into the sump. It's not like a, a normal engine where you have oil pumped out of the sump. It just sits there. It's called a wet sump and it splashes lubrication. So if you have too much there, it just splashes everything and it just covers everything in oil. Uh, there's rather more there than I was expecting. <laughs> A drop of petrol and it's time to see if this Grand Prix winner will start. First time, good. Very good. Great. Not bad for a Brooklyn's legend in its 90s. How about that? <laughs> That's all right, wasn't it? Was, wasn't it? Sounded kind of good? Yeah, it does, isn't it? I'm really impressed. Well done, Dad, for starting it. <laughs> <laughs> After so many years in the saddle, Roger's a natural with the Norton. But today is all about succession. OK, so uh, should we see if I can start it next? Uh, you can try. <laughs> yes! Almost. It nearly bit you, yes. And after a few more goes... Technology, eh? That was quite amazing, wasn't it? First time I've started it. Yeah. No, it it's got was... to be good. First time. Looking forward to next week now, even more. Today has been a bonding experience for father and son. Well, that's a good day, then, isn't it? It is a good day, yes. And if Charles can ride this Brooklyn's track star for his dad in a few days' time, it could be a memory they'll treasure forever. 75 miles away at an airfield in Swindon, Julian and Rob are hoping to get a glider, first assembled in the 80s at Brooklyn, back into the air. But it's risky, so risky that this maverick has brought in a top gun. This is a job for test pilot Dan Griffiths. My history is uh, Air Force fast jet, so Harriers, then went into the test world with the Air Force, um, and then left the Air Force and went to the Civil Aviation Authority as a test pilot. You can be my wingman anytime, Dan. We made it, Rob. Dan. Hi, guys. How are you, man? Yeah, good, good, good. Long time no see. Yeah, good journey. Finally, we made it. <laughs> what do I enjoy? More wacky. That's the way I like it. And aircraft don't come much more wacky than Ladybird. Fantastic. 
Now that is what I call a very, very small engine. <laughs> and an even smaller propeller. Getting Ladybird airborne takes the team into uncharted and dangerous territory, which is why Dan's been drafted in and Julian's been grounded. Okay. Okay, nice and gently. With all the pieces out, it's time to rebuild Ladybird once more. Sorry, this is the right way, so yeah. let me go first. And it goes a whole lot more smoothly second time around. Yeah. This is Special. the most critical <laughs> component of the airplane. Perfect. Because without string, it wouldn't be held together properly. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Lady Bird is looking good, but she's not known for her taxiing skills, so the team have to manoeuvre her into position. And then we're going to the far corner over there, Julian. Yeah? Far corner over there. Good luck. Yeah? Okay. There's a machine. All the best. Right. Perched precariously at the front. I'm ready. There's nothing between Dan and the ground if the worst happens. Bit of throttle? I don't think so. Okay. It may not be a fighter jet, but the principle is the same. He needs power and lift. But despite hitting speeds of 40 miles per hour and having great maneuverability, Ladybird stays grounded. We're not getting enough power from the engine to really get it airborne. The ground crew need to problem solve on the fly. I, I've got to be honest, I think it just needs more horsepower. Yeah. That engine's not rowing up enough, I don't No, think. no, I realise that. Close. Just needs a bit more thrust, a bit more power. Julian can't give Dan more power, but he has got a plan. Can I ask you, Dan, an, uh, an, an indecent question? Yeah. How much you weigh? I weigh about 78 kilos. OK. That's low, really. It's quite low, yeah. I, I weigh 67, so maybe I'm 10 kilos less than you. Maybe yep. I should give it a go. Are you sure that's a good idea, Julian? You may have a weight advantage, but he is an actual test pilot. But before you can say chocks away, he's off. It takes a lap or two for Julian who isn't legally obliged to wear a helmet, by the way, to get a feel for this grand old glider. He pushes the engine to its limits. But even with a lighter pilot in the hot seat, Ladybird stays grounded. It's not the result they wanted, but everybody and the glider are still in one piece. And today's been about so much more than defying gravity. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. It's just a one, uh, just an, a beautiful machine and the feeling of just sitting on top of that with a little, little engine at the back and giving it a go. It's just, just, a, just, I can't describe it, to be honest with you. You have more fun than me, you know that. I know that. But you had fun watching me. No, you have fun watching me. <laughs> Getting Ladybird this far is a huge achievement, but the team need to redouble their efforts if this glider is going to live up to her name. At Goodwood Estate in Sussex, it's race day for Nick and Gareth. The revival is motor racing as it used to be, vintage fashion and wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat on this historic track. And Team Talbot are out in force with a squad of cars that regularly raced at Brooklyn's last century and are still pushing speeds of 100 miles per hour today. Mm -hmm. 
they're hoping to scoop the Brooklands Trophy, awarded to the winner of a fiercely contested race for vintage sports cars. Gareth's been working round the clock to rebuild the engine of the car he's driving, Go 52. Our engine basically went back in last weekend. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty tight. Very tight. Well, we yeah. said it would be tight, and it was tight, yeah. but it's done. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, fingers crossed, it should be yeah. okay. Nick owns and drives Go 54, but Go 52, Gareth's ride, belongs to John Ruston, who's expecting great things from today. Hopefully, we can win a pre-war sports car race at Goodwood. As long as they come back all in one piece, with the wheels pointed the right way, I think that's the success. It's time to make their way to the pre-race paddock. The team are bullish about their chances and have prepped like pros. But there's one thing that's out of their control. It's starting to drizzle a bit now, but if it starts to rain more, then this circuit will become very, very slippery. And that will give their arch rivals the edge. The biggest competition is the Fraser Nash. And now that the weather has changed, the advantage is, has gone to, to the light cars. Gareth knows the Fraser Nash cars will slide well in the wet, and the Go cars won't. The Talbots will have to be on their A-game to outrace this 1932 replica. It's easy to imagine back to the glory days of Brooklands as magnificent motors make their way to the start line. Brooklands Trophy then, the weather conditions here at Goodwood as you can see are not very clever at all. As they go, and the Fraser Nash gets the draw, and they spin up, and away he goes. The Fraser Nash makes a blinding start, but the go-cars are snapping at its heels, and the conditions on the track are starting to have an effect. Right, oh, we've got a 53 spinner. That's the BMW 328. Yeah. Now, one of our tours has pulled off. Very unusual. They were very reliable cars. It's Gareth, gutting for him and Go 52's owner John. It's finished. That's it. It's parked on the side of the road just after the, after the finish line. I can see it from down here. Not what was expected. That leaves Go 54 still in the race. The much lighter Fraser Nash takes full advantage of the conditions. There's oh, oh, that's almost too much. Lovely. Nearly a bridge too far. Oh, goodness me. And takes the chequered flag with driver Eddie Williams at the wheel. Uh, yeah, really good fun. Perfect condition for the Fraser Nash. Not just for them, you know, how competitive they are, but how fun they are to drive in the weather. Nick came 21st, but Gareth failed to finish. What happened then, Gareth? Uh, uh, third lap, coming out of the chicane, second gear, third gear, just lost all drive. Oh, no. Uh, end of that. Oh. You drove well. Yeah. You actually uh, actually beat me for once. I did. It's a yeah. great rarity. I don't think that's ever happened before. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. It'll probably uh, never happen again. <laughs> make the most of it. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a momentous day for Charles Bird. His father, Roger, has gifted him a 1928 Model 18 Norton with a very special pedigree. This raced at Brooklands in the 1927 Brooklands Grand Prix and actually won the race. So it's quite a significant machine. Charles has never ridden his bike, but today he's hoping all that changes. I know my dad is going to be incredibly proud when I ride the bike for the first time. It'll be riding on the bank where the bike won the Grand Prix all those years ago. Uh, yeah, it will certainly be go down in one of the mo most memorable things I've done in my life. Having only just passed his test, Charles is keen to check out the riding conditions. Oh, looking at this track, you know, down the, down the home straight, the bankment, even walking up it now, you can feel the, you know, the steepness of it and the grip, uh, wow, amazing. Really is amazing just to think 
of all those years ago, bikes used to race around here. It's the moment Charles has been waiting for. Okay. Whoa. What a throttle. You said I was going to stall it. <laughs> Don't leave it, leave it like that. I know it's a lifelong dream, Charles, but there's no way you're going to let your 76-year-old dad give you a bump start, are you? Right. Oh, OK, you are. No, a bit faster. Oh, yeah! Woo -hoo 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 -hoo! It's beginning to look a lot more like Charles's bike. Oh yeah, baby! Wow. How was that, Dad? Yeah, don't stall it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Amazing. Roger knows that his beloved Norton is going to be in safe hands. I was really impressed. Yes, he was brilliant. I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's not you just jump on it and ride it. it it's, it's really something diff altogether different. It's, it's not like nothing you can prepare for. Amazing. What an experience. <laughs> Very proud. I mean, I think I'm more proud that he's actually interested in it and interested in Brooklands because it's passing it on to the next generation. And that's what's needed. You know, to be given this opportunity and to make my dad proud is the icing on the cake. Uh, to actually ride this bike, uh, absolutely, absolutely amazing. Teaching your son to ride a bike is one of life's loveliest moments. And if you're 76 and he's 47, and the bikes are Brooklyn's belter, well, that just makes it all the more special. Wow, amazing. What an experience. Julian and Dan are desperate to get a decades-old Brooklyn's glider flying. Let's call it today. I think Although, so. Next time, I go first. Having tried and failed with an underpowered engine, it's time to try winching Ladybird into the air. It is, it is quite likely that this glider was always meant to be winched, to get airborne, and once it's airborne, the engine is just to keep it being held in the air, if you saw that. They've come to the Channel Gliding Club in Dover, where many modern gliders get airborne with the help of cables. If this doesn't work, Ladybird may never fly. Um, Shall we put it into position? Yes, so we can compete with So we can compete with this, uh, these modern rubbish. <laughs> lovely day, lovely place and a lovely machine. So, all good, really. Ready to go. After months of planning, research and preparation, Julian must put all doubts behind him and trust in the Ladybird and her original design. Julian pulls back the stick And Ladybird finally glides into the air. For a few glorious seconds, she proves all of Julian's aspirations right. Before a graceful landing back on terra firma. Very well. It went up quite quickly, I thought, and uh, quite amazing. It just flies beautifully. Fantastic. Excellent. Well done. Well done. Just great. Shall we uh, take her back? Head home, Dan. Julian's just getting started. I'm very keen to turn it around, 
put the engine on, see if I can just roll it back. He doesn't want to waste a second of life's glorious adventure. He knows that time flies. Lucky for him, then, that he's such a wonderful pilot. That was an amazing, amazing experience and feeling. And um, it's a cert certainly for me, and I think more than me, uh, a very memorable day. It represents the conclusion of an amazing journey.